Last time, King Antiochus Theos had been fatally poisoned by his estranged wife, Laodice. Now that Laodice had killed the king, she had to act fast to secure power. If it became known that she had murdered Antiochus Theos, who had been a respected and popular ruler, the cities and the satraps of the empire would soon turn against her. To prevent this, Laodice had taken a peasant into her service, named Artemon, who was the spitting image of Antiochus. After disposing of the king's body, she dressed Artemon in his clothes and placed the peasant in the king's bed. Claiming the king was ill, she restricted access to him and began to issue commandments in his name, acting as though she was relaying them on behalf of the ailing monarch. This deceit was successful, and Laodice's orders were obeyed. Posing as her dead husband, she had his new wife, Berenike, repudiated, and her child, Antiochus, disinherited. At the same time, Laodice had her eldest son, Seleucus, who was about 18 years of age, promoted to co-ruler with his father, and they set to work securing their position. Berenike, having learnt what had been decreed, and that Laodice and Seleucus were on their way, fled with her child to the sanctuary at Daphne, outside of Antioch. Forces sent ahead by Laodice followed, and besieged Berenike there. This caused outrage across the empire, particularly in Anatolia, where many chose to recognize the infant Antiochus as king, rather than Seleucus. Sophron, the governor of Ephesus, was with Laodice at the time, but she suspected him of disloyalty and planned to murder him. While they were in a meeting together, Danae, who was a confidant of Laodice and had been a mistress of Sophron, covertly gave the governor a hand signal, indicating the plot against him. Sophron pretended to agree with whatever Laodice said, excused himself from the meeting, and then rode as fast as his horse would take him back to Ephesus. Laodice immediately suspected Danae and demanded answers from her, but she remained tight-lipped. So Laodice had her dragged to the edge of a cliff and thrown to her death. Sophron, having arrived back at Ephesus, rejected the rule of Seleucus and invited the Egyptians to retake control of the city, who subsequently sent a fleet to Ephesus. In Egypt, Ptolemy II Philadelphus had died and was succeeded in a smooth transition by Ptolemy III Euergetes, who had been ruling as co-king for the previous two years. Euergetes, of course, was the brother of Queen Berenike and must have been perturbed by the events unfolding in Syria. However, for the time, he was distracted by Antigonus Gonatas, who had sent a fleet once again to repel Egypt from the Cyclades. The fleet from Ephesus was dispatched, led by Sophron, and sailed to Andros, where they met the Antigonid navy led by Antigonus himself. The Egyptian fleet was repelled, and the Cyclades were once again lost. The League of the Islanders fell apart after this, and became irrelevant as a political entity. Ptolemy would give no more attention to controlling the central Aegean, as now the situation with his beloved sister had deteriorated to such a state that he felt the need to directly intervene and so personally set off from Egypt with his army. But he had departed too late, and Berenike was betrayed from within by a group of Galatian bodyguards, who, from the beginning, had been agents of Laodice. Despite the violent resistance of her handmaidens, Berenike and Antiochus were killed. Seeking to quell the growing resistance against her son's rule, Laodice attempted the same ruse she had accomplished with her husband, pretending that Berenike and Antiochus were still alive, in order to quieten any accusations of foul play. Sailing from Cyprus and landing in Syria, Ptolemy was welcomed with honours by the city governments of Seleucia, Pieria, and Antioch. This is not overly surprising, given Ptolemy was there on behalf of the theoretical Antiochus III, his nephew, not as a foreign conqueror. Shortly afterwards, Ptolemy arrived in Daphne with his advance guard. There he discovered the deceit which had been made against him, and learnt that his sister and nephew were in fact dead. Furious at this, he sought to turn Laodice's lie against her, and now claimed to be acting on behalf of King Antiochus, encouraging the cities of the empire to turn themselves over to him. This worked well, and after securing Syria, Ptolemy was able to march all the way to Babylon before the year had ended. Multiple sources suggest Ptolemy managed to march as far as Bactria and the easternmost edge of the empire which is improbable, but certainly not impossible by any means. In any case, Ptolemy had effective control of the entire empire outside of Anatolia, 
where Seleucus and Laodice still held sway. After this had been accomplished, Ptolemy suspended his campaign and returned to Egypt, taking with him 40,000 talents of silver and 25,000 precious vessels and statues of gods, including idols taken by the Persian king Cambyses II when he had conquered Egypt in the 6th century BC. Precisely why he returned to Egypt has long been something of a mystery. Ancient sources mention some sort of internal strife or revolt, but provide no specifics. Modern environmental science has suggested that the Nile, during this period, may not have flooded for a period of several years due to increased volcanic events during that time, which would have the result of reducing the grain supply in Egypt. If one also considers that one of the religious roles of the pharaoh was to ensure regular flooding, this swell could have been the spark for Egyptian revolt against their Greek overlords. This strife would occupy most of Ptolemy's attention for the next several years, giving Seleucus and Laodice a chance to restore their realm. Seleucus first assembled a fleet with which to attack some of the coastal cities which had revolted, such as Ephesus. However, this fleet was struck by a fierce storm which totally obliterated it, with Seleucus barely escaping with his life. Justin attributes this storm to divine punishment for his act of patricide. With the navy out of action, Seleucus lost control over Thrace, being on the other side of the Propontis, which Ptolemy took advantage of, bringing cities such as Ainos under his sway. Within the Seleucid Empire, the truth of the death of Berenike and Antiochus must have been revealed, for many cities in Asia Minor which had raised their banners against Seleucus in the name of King Antiochus ended their revolts and rejoined the empire. For while the governments of these cities were happy to be an alliance of convenience with Ptolemy, they had no desire to be an incorporated part of the Ptolemaic kingdom, which they had long fought against. Before campaigning elsewhere, Seleucus sought to secure the loyalty of Cappadocia to the Seleucid crown. Ariarathes III was willing to do so, but the price was not cheap. Seleucus would have to cede the region of Cataonia to Cappadocia. Needing all the support he could muster, Seleucus agreed to this exchange. Seleucus thereafter marched into Syria, where he was able to retake the capital of Antioch and much of the region unopposed, although parts of Syria remained under Ptolemaic power, particularly by the coast. Shortly after, he moved into Mesopotamia, which also welcomed him. At this time, he refounded the city of Nicephorium as Kalinicum, meaning glorious victory, perhaps suggesting that he had won a victory nearby but no details of this hypothetical battle are known. There is a mention of a Ptolemaic general named Xanthippus being put in command of the lands across the Euphrates, so presumably any battle fought would have been against him. Callinicus would also be the name by which this King Seleucus would be remembered by posterity. However, the extent to which he was able to retake the eastern provinces was limited. Upon the invasion of Ptolemy Euergetes, and the collapse of central Seleucid power in 246 BC, some of the eastern satrapies had declared their independence. Diodotus, the satrap of Bactria, declared himself a king, began minting his own currency, and thus founded what is today known as the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom. Andragoras, the satrap of Parthia, also revolted and declared the autonomy of his region. The extent to which these two regions were truly independent is a matter of some debate. It is entirely possible that they were now effectively vassals and still paid lip service to the Seleucid Empire. After all, due to the size of the realm and the diversity of its peoples, regional governors had always maintained some level of autonomy, and the Seleucid manner of governing was certainly more hands-off than the other Hellenistic monarchies. In any case, direct control over Bactria and Parthia was now lost to the Empire and due to the ongoing conflict against Egypt, Seleucus did not have the time or resources to bring these satrapies to heel. He returned to Syria and resumed his campaign there, but soon after he suffered a major reverse, perhaps at the hands of yet another Antiochus, who Ptolemy had left in charge in the region, but nothing more is known about this individual. This defeat prompted a retreat to Antioch by Seleucus, who then sent for reinforcements from his younger brother Antiochus, who had remained in Sardis. However, Antiochus refused to send aid, unless Seleucus elevated him to co-regent. As Antiochus was only about 14 at this time, 
it is questionable how much this was his own doing, and how much he was being manipulated by his mother, Laodice. Certainly the idea that Antiochus was a puppet of his mother has long been a popular one. Justin does claim that Antiochus was greedy beyond his years, and due to this behaviour was known as Hyrax, the hawk, for in his grasping behaviour, he was more like a bird of prey than a man. Due to Seleucus' desperate need for assistance, he had no choice but to acquiesce to this demand, and made his brother a king also, giving him authority over Asia Minor. Using the soldiers provided by his brother, Seleucus was able to recover from his defeat and take the fight once again into Kole, Syria, taking the town of Orthosia and then seizing Damascus. The island of Aratus also came back into the empire at this time, in exchange for an increased level of autonomy. Once again though, Seleucus was repelled, his gains were lost, and after this, in 241 BC, a peace treaty was negotiated. In essence, the borders returned to how they had been prior to the Second Syrian War, with all the conquests of Antiochus Theos being ceded to Ptolemy, the legacy of the king's reign undone. Importantly, Ptolemy retained control over the city of Seleucia Pieria, the port of Antioch and the burial site of Seleucus Nicator himself a great humiliation for the empire. The war was over, but the cost had been exceedingly great for Seleucus. He had had to either cede or tolerate the independence of a great deal of territory on every side of the empire, and had had to divide what was left of his realm with his younger brother. To attempt to restore the empire to what it had been under the reign of his father, let alone the reign of Seleucus Nicator, would be a colossal long-term undertaking. In Greece, Antigonus had been unsuccessful in his efforts to expel his nephew Alexander from Corinth. However, this conflict had not spiralled into a wider civil war, as the Ptolemies had desired. Rather, it seems like Alexander was content to reign in luxury as the Lord of Corinth. Antigonus was not content with this state of affairs though, and had Alexander assassinated by poison. Following his death, his widow Nicaea maintained the independence of the city. In 245 BC, Antigonus offered to her marriage to his son Demetrius, who was much younger than her, and she readily accepted. A grand wedding was arranged, and after the ceremony, during a performance by the famed musician Amobius, Antigonus assaulted and took the fortress of Acro Corinth, which controlled the city, as the guards were all distracted by the revelry. In this way, the independence of Corinth was ended, and the city came back under Macedonian domination. However, Antigonus's rule would not go unchallenged for long. Since its re-establishment circa 280 BC, the Achaean League had continued to grow and become more powerful, unified in their opposition to Antigonus and their desire for freedom. In the city of Sicyon, a statesman named Aratus had risen to prominence and had liberated the city from its Antigonid-aligned tyrant. To help maintain the independence of Sicyon from Antigonid aggression, Aratus had set sail for Egypt Arriving at the court in Alexandria, Aratus endeared himself to Ptolemy by gifting him fine works of art from Greece. The king, in return, granted him 40 talents of silver immediately, which would be followed up with another 110 talents, to be paid in installments. Upon Aratus's return, he had then joined his city to the Achaean League, becoming the first non-Achaean city to become a member, and in 245 BC was elected as Strategos of the League. After a brief war against the Aetolians, in 243 BC, Aratus turned his attention to Corinth, recognising the strategic necessity of taking it if the League was to continue its rise. Four brothers of Sicyonian extraction lived in Corinth, one of whom was a soldier in the garrison of the Acro Corinth. When the other three brothers happened to be in Sicyon, they mentioned to Aratus of a cleft in the cliff on which the fortress stood, by way of which one could reach the walls undetected at a point where they were only 15 feet high. When Aratus marched on the Acro Corinth, he took a body of 400 picked men, and, under the cover of night, they entered this fissure and scaled the walls with ladders. The defenders in the fort did not become aware of the Achaean presence until they had already made it over the walls. By dawn, the attackers had taken the citadel and opened the gates to the rest of the army. With the fortress taken, the rest of the city turned itself over to him. Shortly after, the cities of Megara, Treason, and Epidaurus all joined the League. Antigonus had now lost all control over the Peloponnese. 
After this great success, Ptolemy made a commitment to continue his support of Aratus and the Achaean League, and was made the honorary hegemon of the League. Back in Asia in 241 BC, Eumenes I, Lord of Pergamon, who had defeated Antiochus Sota and won the independence of his city, drank himself to death after a 22 year reign. He was succeeded by his nephew, Attalus, who was just 28 years old. He would not be content as his uncle was to be just the lord of his city, but turned his eyes on the lands of the crumbling empire which surrounded him. In Syria, Seleucus Callinicus received dire news of his brother, Antiochus Hyrax. No longer content to be a co-ruler, Antiochus had declared his independence from the rest of the empire, refusing to acknowledge the kingship of his brother any longer. So the empire, only freshly recovered from one great war, was immediately plunged into another. Next time, brother will wage war against brother in a violent struggle for what remains of their father's empire. If you have any comments, criticism, or questions, please post them below, and thank you for listening.